right now, right now, I tell people all the time that right now is the most exciting time to be involved in technology. Right now is the most exciting time to be involved in technology. Why do I say that? Look around. IT has moved from the, the back room to the boardroom. Every industry, every company is transforming through technology. That's why right now is the most exciting time to be involved in technology. Look back to 1965, Gordon Moore. We've all heard Moore's Law, right? That the power of technology, the power of compute will double every two years. He said that in 1965. Technology had only been around for eight to 10 years. Look at it now, 55 years later, and he was right. It has doubled every two years. That's why right now is the most exciting time. Back in the 600s, back in the 600s, the, the game of chess was invented. And this mathematician invented the game and he brought it to one of the kings. And the king was so excited for this new game he said, I will grant you any wish. Awesome. The mathematician says, well, I want you to take that chessboard. And on the first square, I want you to put a single grain of rice. On the second square, put two grains of rice. On the third, put four. And on the fourth, put eight. And continue to double it across the chessboard. By the time the king reached the halfway point, 32 squares, there were 4 billion grains of rice on the chessboard. By the time he got to the 64th square, the pile of rice was as tall as Mount Everest. That's the power of doubling. That's the power of exponential growth. Have trouble imagining a pile of rice as tall as Mount Everest? Say my stride is two and a half, maybe three feet long and I take 32 steps, where am I gonna be? Probably somewhere out there in the hallway, maybe, maybe in one of the breakout rooms across there. If I doubled my stride with every step, where would I be in 32 steps? I will have circumnavigated the globe 14 million times in 32 steps. That's the power of doubling. This is the world we live in. Eric Bryn Josephson and Andrew McAfee, in their book, Race Against the Machine, they did the math. If technology as an industry was created sometime in the mid 50s, and we've been doubling every two years, we reached the halfway point of the chessboard in 2006. So let's look back on the last 10 years. 10 years ago, the iPhone had been out for one year. We're now at the iPhone 10, as, as well as iPads and iWatches and i everything else. Chrome, Chrome did not exist 10 years ago. And it is the most popular browser in the world. Tesla, Tesla gives us two great examples. Electric cars. Pretty cool. Even cooler, autonomous cars, self-driving vehicles. There are buses today in Las Vegas that are driving around without a driver. How freaking cool is that? Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, all disrupted their industries in the last 10 years. Talk about disrupting an industry, the death of the album. Spotify and streaming music. How many here used their GPS on their phone to get to this meeting today in some way, shape, or form? A lot of people. It's pretty cool. 10 years ago, you couldn't do a GPS on your cell phone. You had to have a separate device, and even then it wasn't so accurate. I can remember getting in trouble by uh, uh, one of my bosses because 
uh, his GPS directed him to the middle of a pond. But even better than GPS on your phone, live traffic updates. I was on my way home from St. Louis just last week, driving across I-70, and Google alerted me to an 11-mile backup on I-70, and then routed me around through, I know you guys aren't uh, Indiana folks, but a lot of you, through Camby, Indiana. I can tell you, in 60 years, I have never been in Camby, Indiana, but I found my way home because of Google and GPS. 3D printing, disrupting the manufacturing sector across the globe. But even cooler than making this cool little octopus guy, bioprinting, the ability to make 3D body parts with a printer. It exists. It exists. 3G, 4G, and now 5G. Think what 10 gigabits per second is going to do to change our daily lives. Think what it's going to do to change our businesses. That's why right now is the most exciting time to be involved in technology. Now, many of you know, I used to sit on the other side of the desk. I was your client. I was your prospect. I was your buyer. I started my career as a long-haired hippie COBOL programmer. Way back in a decade that eh, probably had a seven, maybe an eight in it. Um, my, my wife calls that my porn star mustache. I think I rock it, just to tell, tell you the truth, I think I rock that. But I started, I was a coder, I was a programmer. I loved nothing more than writing code. To listen to a business problem and be able to solve it with software. It was a rush. Throughout my career, later in my career, I got drugged kicking and screaming into management. I did not want to do management. Play those politics? Not for me. I'm just going to code. I'm just going to sit there and code. But eventually, I did go into management. At one point, I was the director for the Enterprise Services Center for what is now Technicolor. Sam, wherever you are, you know we've been uh, having those conversations. I had staff of 50 Thompson employees at that time, we were called Thompson, and 200 contractors on four different continents. I eventually became CIO. I had the opportunity to lead two fantastic organizations as their CIO. The first one was a billion dollar commercial real estate developer, and the second one was one of the largest nonprofits in the world. But I was recognized not because I was a CIO. I was recognized because I was a CIO that transformed his business through the evolutionary power of technology. Sound familiar? <laughs> it better, <laughs> it, it better sound familiar. But that's what I did. It was about the business. It was about transforming the business and using technology to do it. Today, as your SVP of product, uh, much shorter hair uh, than before, I still stay connected with CIOs across the globe. I founded the Indy CIO Network about 10 years ago. It's still in existence today. It's about 275 CIOs and senior IT leaders in central Indiana. We meet two or three times a month. Now these are CIOs and senior IT leaders from a wide variety of industries, a wide variety of company sizes, wide variety of technical backgrounds. So we have everything from a, a, a one person shop to an IT department of a thousand people. We have everything from a manufacturer to uh, the uh, Simon Property Mall conglomerate, if you know Simon Property. Those CIOs are in this group. And when we meet, what we're talking about are the challenges and the issues facing the CIO. How are we solving them? What are we doing? How are we advancing our businesses? And we learn so much from each other. 
I walk away from each one of those meetings with a nugget. I'm also very connected on social media. And some may think, well, that's really no big deal, but I have over 4,000 connections on LinkedIn and Twitter. Some of the best business contacts that I have, I've never met face to face. I've only met them online. Some of my contacts include, now these folks I have met face to face, Paul Chapman of Box, Vic Begat, former CIO of EMC, Patty Hatter, neighbor of Jonathan, Patty Hatter, former CIO of McAfee and Intel. Great leaders. You learn every time you talk to them. But also the corporate CIO. And I can tell you the corporate CIO has a little bit different mindset than the tech CIO. You have to approach them differently. You have to talk to them differently. So corporate CIOs, like Alita Jeffers. Alita is the CIO for the city of Aurora, Colorado. And she is transforming the public sector through the power of technology. Jamie Lee, no, not, not that Jamie Lee. Jamie Lee, who is the CIO for Wabash National. What do they do? Wabash National makes tractor trailers, semi-truck trailers. Now there's an industry that screams technology, doesn't it? But the technology, the IoT devices, and the data that Jamie and his team are putting into those trailers is transforming an entire industry. Brad Fruth, CIO of Bex Hybrid Seed. Farming, another one of those industries that just screams transformation. But picture this, drones flying over the cornfields of Indiana, measuring the plant height at different points of the growing season and the data that's being pulled off of that. Precision agriculture, the ability through technology to put the right amount of water, the right amount of fertilizer, the right amount of pesticides per square foot. That's transformational. That is setting industry on fire through the evolutionary power of technology. I love our mission. I love our vision. I wish I was this articulate when I was a CIO several years ago to, to say it in this way, because this is what I was doing for those organizations. That's what Alita and Jamie and, and, and Brad are doing for their industry and hundreds of others. We talk today a lot about being a strategic service provider. I wanna talk for a few minutes about what that means to me from my uh, prior seat as CIO. Every sales executive that walks into the CIO's office says, I wanna be your partner. I wanna be your partner. I wanna be your partner. What that usually means is, I wanna sell you something. Right? And every CIO that I know says, I want more partners and fewer vendors. I, was, I, I said that, I said that a lot. Well, what does that mean to be a partner? What does it mean to be a strategic service provider? I boil it down to three things. Trust, transparency, and respect. Trust, transparency, and respect. But I got to thinking as CIO, if I want trust, transparency, and respect from my vendor partners, I have to give them trust, transparency, and respect. Any marriage counselor on the planet, and don't ask me why I know this, any marriage counselor on the planet will tell you that marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. It is a 100% 100% proposition. There's no such thing as meeting halfway. You have to meet all the way. I took that to heart as CIO. So what did I do? Every year, I would have a two-day offsite with my direct reports, our, our planning summit. And we would celebrate the victories of the last year. We would review the lessons learned and how we could improve. And we would make plans for the next year, the year after that, and the year after that. I let my vendors behind the curtain. 
I invited them to my planning summits. They got to celebrate with us our victories. They got to understand where we fell short. They got to know my budgets, my objectives, my constraints, and my aspirations. That first year when we did this, we didn't really know what a strategic service provider was. We didn't know what a strategic partner was. So we just rank ordered them in the amount of money we were spending with them. We drew the line at 12, and each vendor could bring two people. There were ground rules, because you might be sitting next to your competitor, and I didn't care. This wasn't about you, this was about me. This was about my company and my department. So we set the, the ground rules. Over the years, we evolved and we began to understand the difference between a strategic service provider and, and other providers. So we ended up tiering them, very much like we're, we tier our vendors that we work with today. Our tier one vendors we called strategic partners. These were the ones that we knew because we'd gotten to know them over the years, were forward thinking. They thought strategically. They knew their, their space and they knew what was happening two and three years down the road. The next tier were our key vendors. Those vendors that, yes, we had a big spend with, but maybe they didn't think quite so strategically as some of the others. And then the third tier was uh, everyone else. The first two tiers always got invited to the summits, but only the strategic vendors got a seat at the table when we were talking strategy for the next year, two years, three years. Now, these offsites always included a couple of things, and, and I bring this up because we've talked a lot about EBCs. EBCs is kind of the, the, the mirror image of what we were doing with those summits, right? You're bringing your executives, the clients in to talk to them about what we, what we do. But each one of these summits included two things that I think were vital to their success. The first one was it always included a meal. It sounds really cliche and, and dorky to say, breaking bread together forms bonds. When you're having a meal with someone, you're not talking about switches and routers and data and this and that. You're talking about your kids, your grandkids, where you went on vacation, what you're doing for your next vacation. You're getting to know them on a personal level. That's how you can become a strategic service provider. You know their goals, you know their aspirations, you know what makes them work. Nothing pissed me off more as a CIO than a, 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 someone who came into my office trying to sell me something that we ourselves did. It's like, really? You wanna recycle all my hardware? Hello, we're Goodwill, what do you think we do with it? Right, but people got to know me through this process. So we broke bread together, that's why Sales executives take people to lunch, take them to drinks, take them to play golf, take them to play bocce ball, right? It builds that bond, it builds that trust. The other thing that it, we included in each and every one, and, and Jamie, I'm gonna challenge you to add this to the EBC somehow, we called it an adventure. Every year we did an adventure. And I was the only one, along with my uh, executive assistant, that knew what the adventure was. So that first year, we were having a cookout because I always had my summit at a state park. We were having a, a cookout. And uh, so we're all standing around networking, which as you guys know, in technology is a euphemism for cocktails, right? So we're standing around networking and up pull two huge John Deere tractors with huge hay wagons behind them. Yes, I took my vendors for a ride. I took them for a hay ride. Suits, ties, high heels, and skirts. I told them to dress casually. Next time, they'll listen to me. Another year, we did a Twitter scavenger hunt. We divided into teams, some from the vendors, some from my staff, to mix the teams up. And we gave them 10 clues. They had to solve the clues and go to that location and take a picture of themselves at that location and tweet it. Back at the shelter house, we had a live Twitter feed running. 
so that we could see the fun that everybody was having, the laughs, the jokes, and, and, and the humbling experiences as they had to do a, a roll down the snow hill, the sledding hill that was in July. One year we also had um, a New Year's Eve party, again, in July. New Year's Eve. We had a live DJ. We had balloons. We had streamers. We had noisemakers. I was in a tux. My executive assistant was in a long gown, and we had a party. Why? Because we were celebrating what we had all accomplished together over the last five years. My team and our strategic and key partners, we were celebrating. Now, why do I tell you all that about the, the adventures? Because it creates vulnerability. The way to build trust, transparency, and respect is to let your hair down, be vulnerable. And I'm telling you, no one's ever as vulnerable as you're standing next to a horse taking your picture and then tweeting it. We had some great times, but it created that trust, transparency, and respect. So I challenge you to use your EBCs to do this. Bring your clients in, start having that conversation with them, get to know them, get to know their challenges, get to know their aspirations, and add these things in to what you're trying to do with them. One of the biggest problems that face every CIO I've ever talked to, in fact, Lou, our speaker at lunch, mentioned this. 80% of an IT budget is spent keeping the lights on. Brake fix, hardware upgrades, software upgrades, monitoring, 80%. That only leaves 20% for new. I can tell you this from having sat in that seat, if you only have 20% of your budget, you're not gonna take a lot of risks. You're just gonna do incremental change, right? Incremental change, that's all. So I was sitting in a conference at MIT. I always like to throw that in because it makes me feel smarter to say I was at a conference at MIT. And it was a panel discussion. And one of the panelists looked out at the room and said, you know, there's only two types of IT projects. And we're all scratching our head because I, for one, we categorized our IT projects by about 20 different dimensions. And he says, yes, there's A to C and C to F. And I know you all have been involved in those cluster fire truck projects before. And he was not as polite as I was. And people laughed just like you did. Why? Because we had been involved in those cluster projects. I know I could sit there and think of two or three projects that were going on at that moment that I would categorize as cluster projects. But he says, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a grading scale. There are some projects that you get involved in that you can hit that grand slam home run, walk off the field to win the game. Now, since we're in the shadows of the Golden State Warriors, you could hit that three-pointer at the buzzer to win the championship. But the best grade your business colleagues are gonna give you is a C. No one ever walks into the CIO's office and shakes her hand and says, thank you for delivering my email today. But I guarantee you if email is down, the phone is ringing off the desk and the line goes out her door and down the hall with people ready to complain. On the other side of the coin, there's the AC projects. These are the projects that when you hit that grand slam home run or hit that three pointer to win the game, your team is gonna be recognized for moving your company forward. You will be heroes in the eyes of your business colleagues. If you fall short on one of those projects and maybe don't hit all the objectives, the worst grade that you're ever gonna get is a C. And then he looked out at the room and he said, why on earth would you ever want your team working on CF projects? 
bam, you could have hit me in the face with a two by four. He was right. Why on earth would I ever want my team working on those CF projects? So we went back to the office. We took our project portfolio and we assigned a letter grade to every project that was on that list. It was about 85 or 100 projects. Anything that had a C, D, or F next to it, we asked ourselves a series of questions. Question one, do we still need to deliver this service? Believe it or not, there's a lot of work that IT does that they really don't need to be doing anymore. If the answer was, no, we don't need to deliver that service, we stopped doing it. Pretty simple. But if the answer was yes, we asked ourselves, is there a better way? Is there a better way to deliver that service? Email was a great example. The panelist had used that in his reference. We were getting ready to do yet another exchange upgrade. Yet another exchange upgrade. Was there a better way? What if we could figure out how to deliver that service to our business and never have to upgrade Exchange again? What if we could figure out a way to deliver that service and never have to babysit the blinking lights on an Exchange cluster again? We went Google. Now this was in the days before Office 365, and frankly, Google had a better product than BPOS was. It was the right solution for us. But no more exchange upgrades. No more exchange clusters. We moved so five servers out of our environment that was handling all that email. And my team didn't have to do that work anymore. Next up on the hit parade, should be of no surprise, of those of you who know my background, DR. We were spending two or three months a year preparing for an annual DR test. Now, I don't know about disasters here in California, but in Indiana, you don't get a two month notice that the tornado's coming. But we were spending two or three months a year preparing for that DR test. There had to be a better way. Now, the Blue Lock guys had been in my office for two years and I picked up the phone and called them and said, we need to talk. The time is now. Why? Because I wanted a managed service. I didn't care about the technology. I didn't care about anything other than the fact that they were going to take that off my plate. Blue Lock was the best. Recognized by Gartner, recognized by Forrester, recognized by their customers. I looked at some other folks, but nobody offered that fully managed service that I wanted. A year later, it was time to upgrade the hardware on all our servers. Some genius at some point did our refresh cycle, all of our servers all at the same time. It was me, by the way. And it was time we had to upgrade all these servers. We had to upgrade VMware. Why? I called Blue Lock again because they had an IaaS cloud. And we moved all of our production, test, and development servers into the Blue Lock cloud. Never again would I have to do a hardware refresh on my server farm. I really freaked the folks at Dell out when I told them that. Now, you may be thinking, well, gosh, Jeff, that sounds great. You got rid of all that work. You probably laid off half your staff. You know how many people I laid off? Zero. Zero. What did I do? Jason Fisher. Many of you know Jason. He works for Intervision now. Jason was my senior architect. He was one of those people that was spending two or three months a year on DR. Jason went shopping. No, really. He went shopping. We had over 50 retail stores throughout central Indiana. And Jason went and observed. And he saw that four or five times a month, the line at the checkout registers, the point of sale system, was to the back of the store. 
pretty cool problem to have as a retailer. That much demand that the lines are that long. But what he also saw was people leaving, putting their merchandise back on the shelves and leaving, or turning around as soon as they got in the door and saw the line, too frustrated to wait in line. Jason redesigned our point of sale system and our queuing system at the checkout registers. And the longest line that we saw after that was 10 people. Now there's two metrics that are really, really important in the retail industry. Sales per square foot and sales per shopping cart. Both of those increased by double digits after Jason did that. I had another engineer that I sent to school, sent to high school, because we owned and operated 12 high schools in central Indiana. And I wanted that engineer to watch. How were the teachers engaging with technology? How were the students engaging or not engaging with the technology? And was there a, things that we could do to help them learn? She brought forward the idea of smart boards, uh, the whiteboards that uh, you can write on and then uh, they, they automatically capture it and they can do videos. They're very, very cool technology. But here was the real lesson that she learned because she was there. Think about downtime. We had four nines of uptime on our network. That's pretty damn good. But if that one thousandth of, a, of an hour was when you were teaching a class of 30 high school students and you were relying on the internet connectivity to teach that class and it went down, it struck fear in the eyes of the teacher. Think about the standardized exams that we put our students through all the time. Think about being down when those kids are trying to take that test and they have to start all over again. She got a whole new appreciation for what downtime meant to her customers. We also had a home nursing visitation program. We would send nurses to work with mothers that were uh, first time mothers, but they were at risk because they were in poverty. So we were sending nurses, most of them women, into the worst neighborhoods in Indianapolis to work with these young mothers. They carried binders of materials to be able to teach the mother how to take care of herself and how to take care of her babies. Binders of material. One of my engineers thought, why don't we give them iPads? Because with Find My iPad, we will know exactly where they are at all time. Improved security. We got rid of the binders and replaced it with videos on the iPad, content on the iPad, so that she could work directly with the mother and teach her how to take care of her child. That's the transformative power of technology. That's what happens when you get rid of the C to F projects. This feeds my, my view on our projects. As your SVP of product, this is what I think about. When I look at these product lines, what I see are C to F projects. C to F projects that we can help our clients and become an extension of their IT team so that they can transform their businesses. We were able to tilt the scale ourselves from 80-20 to about 40-60. 60% on innovation. Our clients can do the same thing. So when I look at these and see CF projects, and I think about the future of what we're trying to do with these, think about right premises, right technology, right model. One of the first things we want to do with this product line is make it available on the premises that we cover. Client premises, client co-location, our hosted cloud, and yes, the public scale cloud, the public cloud. Our product managers are leaving here tomorrow afternoon to go visit our friends 
at Infinity and talk about how do we bring managed services to the public cloud? What's different? What's the same? What do we need to learn? What new resources or technologies do we need to deliver these types of products on the public cloud? Right technology and right model, sometimes there's some tension between those two. And it's okay tension. It's absolutely okay tension. When I was talking to Blue Lock about DRAS, I didn't care that they use Zerto. I'd never even heard of Zerto. I still to this day have never logged on to the Zerto console because I didn't care about the technology. I wanted the managed service. Yet there's going to be times when the technology is more important than the managed service. There's going to be a specific feature set that your client needs that you're gonna to need to sell them that technology. And we may not have a managed service around it. And that's okay. That's okay. We will talk about it, we will look at it, and we will ask ourselves a couple of questions. Can we do it? Can we be good at it? Can we make money doing it? And is there a market? Those are the questions that we will ask. But that doesn't mean you can't sell it. Just because we don't have net defend or net tend wrapped around it, that's okay. We still need those technology sales as an organization. Your clients still strategically need that device. You have to get to know them and understand them and know what's more important to them, the right model or the right technology. That's being a strategic service provider. Now we've talked in some of the breakout sessions today about the product roadmap. And I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about how do we do this? How do we determine what products we build? Managed service products specifically, we'll talk about those. Think about your sales funnel. At the top of funnel is every company in your addressable market. Depending on where you are in the country, that might be 500 companies, might be 10,000. As much as we would love it, not every one of those companies is gonna become a client. You're gonna nurture them through your sales funnel and some of them will drop out along the way. But those that make it through the funnel will become clients. It's very similar with, the, with a product idea. At the top of our funnel is every device ever created and the ability to wrap a managed service around them. Over our, through our process, we're going to embrace them, we're going to research them, we may invest in them, and then finally at the end, we're going to commit to building them. I want to point out a couple of our inputs there on the left side, because I think they're very important to this group. Sales feedback. You are our eyes and ears with prospects and with clients. Product wants to engage with you. We're going to be establishing a cadence of meetings between product and sales to talk about what are you seeing? What's working with our product set? What's not working with our product set? What are your clients saying? What are your prospects saying? We need that feedback to feed our funnel. Strategic Alliances and Jonathan. Uh, if you haven't met Jonathan, Jonathan, raise your hand. Uh, Senior Director of Strategic Alliances. Jonathan's gonna be working with our OEMs and distributors uh, whose products we resell and whose products we use to deliver our managed services. His input from the market is gonna go into our funnel. I could go through each one of these and give you examples, but I wanna drop all the way down to the bottom because this has been a question that has come up in just about every one of the breakout sessions today on product. Agile product development process. That's a fancy word for saying, believe it or not, you're gonna have an opportunity to sell something that we don't have a SKU for. I know it's hard to believe that that would ever happen, uh, but it's, it could, it could. What we need to do is have a fast, agile process that we can help you evaluate that 
asking those questions that I mentioned earlier, and making a very, very quick decision so that you can move forward in your sales cycle. You're going to be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. But all of those go through our product cycle, and once the executive team says commit, it goes into the product development process. And I know Jamie and I go back and forth a lot about, well, why does it take so long? Why is it going to take six months to do SD-WAN, right? You have to have implementation guides. You have to have product specs. You have to have a product overview. You have to have operating guides so we know what we're doing to operate it. You have to have support guides so we know how to support it. We've got to provide marketing enablement materials to the marketing department so they can market that as a GA product. And we have to give you the tools, the sales enablement tools, to go repeat it and sell it again. All of that goes into the product development cycle. We're, like I said, we're going to be talking more about that. Uh, Kevin is working on a, a presentation that we can sit down and go through that in more detail with, with you folks. Now, I know Kevin went through these product lines, and in the interest of time, I'm going to breeze by these next two slides. But you've seen our product lines. You've sat through what are our key initiatives going through. Now you understand the context, the lens that I look at these product lines through as your SVP of product. Hopefully, it gives you a little bit of an understanding of the mess that's going on inside this head. So I want to go back to the doubling of exponential growth in compute power. If we hit the halfway point of the chessboard in 2006, which by all intents and purposes we did, in 2013, the compute power surpassed that of a mouse. Not the little clicky thing that you use to navigate on your PC, the cute little furry thing with the tail. The compute power of a mouse, big deal. By 2025, compute power will surpass that of the human brain. By 2050, it will surpass that of the entire human population. What an awesome responsibility. What an awesome opportunity to be a part of that. That's why it's the best time to be involved in technology. Right now is your opportunity. Right now is your opportunity to bring your clients in for an EBC, to drive portfolio sales. I can tell you those strategic vendors that I invited to my summit, what did they get out of that? They got a bigger share of my wallet. Talk about portfolio sales. If I, if I had a problem, I was calling them. That's the power of your EBC to create that strategic service provider, to generate portfolio sales. That's why right now is the most important time, exciting time to be involved in technology. Right now is our opportunity to work with our clients and enable them to transform their businesses. Right now is our opportunity to change the world. Awesome. Okay, you can recognize the passion, right? So that was just awesome. I love the passion. I love that uh, comment. So um, we're going to do a couple, have a couple uh, quick chat here, and then we're going to talk about getting on the